Okay, so Parshas Pekude, often it's a double sedra this week, this year, because it's a leap year, Pekude is on its own. And uh, we'll begin with the very first pasuk in the Parsha, Eile Pekude HaMishkon. Moshe Rabbeinu gives an accounting of the Mishkon. This is the sedra now, we've closed the last five sedras, we've pretty much dealt with the Mishkon, Truman Tetzave, and even a bit of Kisisa. And last week, Bayakel, now Pekude, again, they, these are the Parshas that deal with the Mishkon. And now, in the beginning of this week's Parsha, we have an accounting. There is an amazing Medrash Talchuma. Says the Medrash, this is in Pekude Simon Dalit. Eile Pekude HaMishkon, says the Medrash, Veloma Osa Imohim Cheshbon. Why did Moshe Rabbeinu do a Cheshbon with them? I'm reading from the, from the, the second paragraph. If you're listening online, email me please at j.goldcoast.gmail.com and I'll send you the handout. This is a quote from the Medrash Talchuma. Second line, sorry, first line. Vakodesh Baruch Hu HaKadosh Baruch Hu believes Moshe Rabbeinu. Why does he need to do an accounting? Why does he need to do an audit of the Mishkan? It says, Lo avdi Moshe beisi So HaKadosh Baruch Hu believes him. So why is Moshe Rabbeinu doing an audit? Moshe Bova Elo, says the Medrash Tanchuma. Sheshoma Moshe Yisrael Medabim Achrov. Moshe Rabbeinu, the leader of the Jewish people, hears people murmuring. Some of the Jewish people are murmuring after him. Shenemar, and they were looking after Moshe, they were talking, they were watching him as he was leaving his tent to go. What were they saying? So there's a machlokus in the Medrash. They were saying positive, praiseworthy things. Happy is the mother who's given birth to this child, to this Moshe Rabbeinu. He's constantly speaking to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, wow. Reb Chama Reb says, no, it's disparaging, it's negative. People were murmuring negatively about him. What were they saying? Are you Omrim, Re'eid Sabor? I mean, you couldn't make this up. They said about Moshe Rabbeinu, have you seen his neck? Have you seen how thick his neck is? Rosh, have you seen his legs, his thighs? Oichel Meshel Yehudim, he's eating from the Jews. He's, he's, he's looking well fed. And he's eating on their cheshbon. V'shoyse mishel Yehudim is drinking on their cheshbon. V'chol ma sheyesh lo mena Yehudim is all Jewish money. In other words, they're accusing him of pilfering money, of taking money that was dedicated to the Mishkan, and he's lined his own pocket with it. That's why he looks so well fed. V'chavere meshivo and the friend would respond to the other friend. Adam sheesholat hamalech sa Mishkan inat mevaka sheyosher. Don't you expect the person who's been put in charge of the funds of the Mishkan, the head of the building committee, don't you think he's going to become wealthy from it? Of course, what do you expect? Given Sheshoma Moshe Kach, when Moshe Rabbeinu heard this, also lahem, also Omar lahem, he said to them, Chayechem, I promise you, by your lives, Moshe Mishkon Nigmar, when we finish the building of the Mishkon, and the Oise Imochem Cheshmen, I'm going to do a proper audit. Shenema Eilep Kudeham Mishkon. Astonishing. You see from this Medrash, Moshe Rabbeinu responded to the Jewish people who were critical of him, that he was uh, suspected of lining his own pockets with the money that came in, millions of pounds, and that's why he had uh, profited from it. He said, I'm going to do an audit and I'll account for every single penny that has been spent. Now you see from here, and I saw this in the writings of Rabbi Yaakov Bender, a uh, very interesting thing. You see from here a very important lesson in leadership and in chinuch how to behave in this sort of situation. You see, when people take up positions of responsibility, inevitably it attracts jealousy, it attracts bitterness, and it attracts naysayers and leits on him to, to make fun, and they become a target. And how do you respond to that? Because it makes a mark. On one hand, you've got to develop a bit of a thick skin to ignore it and just to press on and to forge on. But on the other hand, you've got to retain some sort of sensitivity, some sort of good bedside manner. So the Rabbi Benda says that you take a look at Moshe Rabbeinu. How did he take it? How, how did he tackle it? I mean, think about it. If you're Moshe Rabbeinu, you've dedicated your life to Klad Yisrael. Your whole 80 years before you took on the position has been preparation for this task. You then go and negotiate with Paru. You go into the lion's den. You bring Klad Yisrael out of Mitzrayim. You take them through the Yamsuf, you have administered all the Makas, and then you bring them out and you feed this whole people, three million people. And you go up to Har Sinai, you battle with Malach and you give them the Torah. 
40 days later, when you eventually you return, some of them are dancing around the golden calf. You're devastated. You go back, you plead on their behalf. And then when they get their kapora on Yom Kippur and they said, build the Mishnah and that will be the Mokham where HaKadosh Baruch will, 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 his Shechina will dwell, and then all of a sudden you're accused of, 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 of stealing from the funds. I mean, it's devastating. M- many people would be, you know, you'd understand if he hang, hang up his uh, leadership and walks off and says, no, thank you. But that's not what Moshe Rabbeinu does. Moshe Rabbeinu says, look, I'm going to prove it to you. I'm going to show you that I've behaved in, an, in, uh, in a way which is totally honest. You can't touch me. Every single penny will be accounted for. And he forges on. He, regards, he disregards their late sonus and their mocking and their accusations. He proves them wrong. And he forges on. He moves on. And that's a very important lesson. Now, Benda mentions, interesting, when the Novomitsk Rebbe was on his way to the Agudu Convention one year, um, and he was there for the Shabbos, and his theme that he was going to speak about was the importance of behaving elachly, making a Kiddush Hashem. But on the Friday before he left his yeshiva, he went into the office and he spoke to the administrator, and he said, listen, can you please confirm that everything here in this yeshiva is above board, that everything there is no kunsim, there's no tricks, and no... Uh, Nothing funny going on. And the administrator said, yes, absolutely. It's all one whiter than white. So then the novel minister says, okay, now I can go. Because if I'm going to practice, if I'm going to preach about being honest, making a Kiddush Hashem, and all our books have got to be uh, scrupulously honest, so I've got to practice what I preach. I've got to check that I'm, uh, I'm living by that standard. And that's really the approach of Godot Yisrael. You, you go on and you forge and you, you forge on and you give that message but you've got to make sure that you behave in a way where you're beyond reproach. <clears throat> Rabbi Benda says that uh, Chovetz Chaim in Radin one day came late to Shachris. So after Shachris, he stood up, he clapped the dinner, and he said, Merav Rabbeisa, I just want to make a short announcement. He said, the reason I was late for Shachris is because I was involved in a mitzvah that no one else could do, and I had to finish it off. I used to mitzvah, part of my mitzvah. That's why I'm late for Shachris. In other words, you should be v'hiyisim nekiyim. You should behave in a way which is beyond reproach. For a bender says about himself that he dav he has the minak to dav in mincha gedola, which means mincha always like at lunchtime, at the first opportunity in the in the early parts of the afternoon, and he has the the min the minak to do so on erev Shabbos. So that means when you dav in mincha, when you go to shul on Friday night, you've already dav in mincha, so you walk in for kabbalah Shabbos. So if shul's going to be at five thirty, you come at quarter to six, ten to six. So you're you know the finished mincha. And now you come for Kabbalah Shabbos. And often he's asked to speak, and invariably he'll stand up and say, that Rabbi Yisrael, I'm just reminding you that I my practice, my minach is to dava mincha gedayla, that people shouldn't think that maybe he's, uh, he's coming late, he's missed mincha. You've got to behave in a way which is beyond reproach, and also educate people, tell people that that's the way you're behaving, that you shouldn't be accused of anything. The source for this, of course, is the Pasuk in Pashas Matis, V'yisim nekiya me Hashem umi Yisrael. You've got to be knocky, you've got to be clean in the eyes of God and in the eyes of, hell, of your fellow man. By uh, Shimon Finkelman is, 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 tells a story that, uh, of uh, Rabbi Sinel Yashev, Rabbi Yashev's late wife, Rabbi Sinchaya Shena and Yashev, that uh, when Rabbi Yashev was alive, he would have, you know, he would have public hours where he would see people. And there would be lines, you know, it was very busy, and you, had, and you had lines of people waiting to see him. And one time during this hour, I think it was either of Nossin Sherman or of Mayor's Lotus, I forget who was online. And Ribbison and Yashov went to every single person on the line and said, please excuse me, I need to go in to speak to my husband and uh, I just need to ask him an urgent question. And she said that to every single person on the line. In other words, she would have been entitled, it's her home, it's her husband, to go into the front of the line and to go and speak to her husband. But that's not how she behaves. You've got to behave in a way which is beyond reproach not only to Hashem, but to your before Klal Yisrael as well. And that's really what Moshe Rabbeinu is teaching us. That is the, the, the behavior of a leader. And interestingly, the parasha ends with the end of Sefer Shemos. We say, Chazak, Chazak. And perhaps that's a, a sort of a shout of Chizuk uh, the, to the leader of the Jewish people, to build, to accomplish, and not to be disheartened by mockery or by naysayers. Okay, now let's move on. 
what's interesting in Parshas Pekude is you hear the phrase Kasha Tziva Hashem Es Moshe or similar repeated, you know, many, many times repeated over and over in this week's Parsha. So there's a very interesting Beis Halevi who discusses this. And this is a Beis Halevi where he addresses the big question. It says, take a look at paragraph two, the first line. Hine, the Maisa Ha'egel, Kvadiv Rabim, Many people have asked and addressed this question. Maro Yisrael al Kocha. How on earth could Klal Yisrael commit the grievous sin of Chet Ha'egel? The Heich Der Dei Akaisa Der Nichshu Bechet Gadol Kazeh. How could they slip up in the Chet of the Egel? Now, in short, the the Beis Halevi has got a theory where he says that they were serving Hakadosh Baruch Hu on their own terms. They wanted to sort of explore ways of serving HaKadosh Baruch Hu in ways which they weren't commanded. And the tikkun for that is to follow what Hashem serves to the letter, to serve HaKadosh Baruch Hu on his terms, not on our terms. Let's take a look at the Beis HaLevi inside. It's the second paragraph. Well, Bezer Novin, with this we can understand, Madhu Parshas Pekudeh, in our Sedra, Da'al Kol Prat for Prat, on every detail of the Mishkan, Baal Maisa, Maisa, and every action made in the Mishkan. Kosov Mufurish Kashatsivo Hashem Es Moshe Batevas Halova. You've got that refrain, that phrase repeated. Haluksovim Kimat, the whole possible possible. It's written almost in every single possible. Sheba Isa Parsha, the Haladovu. What a strange thing. Says the Beis Halevi, Rak or Inyan. The Maisa Ha Mishkan Harid Bola Chapa Alema Maisa Ego. The Mishkan is coming to be an atonement, a kapora for the ego. Like the Medrash says in, in Bayakel, the Medrash Rabbah, they sinned with their gold earrings and nose rings and they pulled them off and threw them into the urn to make a golden calf. It was the same gold which they gave to the Mishkan, which was a kapar. The chait of the Egel, according to the Beis HaLevi, was to serve the idol on, and to serve God on their own terms with their own innovations. Lasos api diosim chachmosim, according to their terms, ma'isa shalonit stavolov to do things which they were not commanded to do. V'lozeb ma'isa mishkan shebola chape, and therefore, when it came to the mishkan, which was a kapara for Klal Yisrael, ne'mar kol asher osu kasher tziva Hashem, they did everything to the letter. They did not deviate one iota. Kaloma. Maybe B'tzalel was able, he knew how to be M'tzarev Oistias, to combine letters in a creative, productive way. That he could actually physically create things. And he knew all the secrets. Notwithstanding that, notwithstanding his ability and his knowledge to do all this, he didn't. He did exactly what HaKadosh Baruch Hu says. Just to do what Kodesh Baruch said. Not because my mind, my brain tells me this. But to do exactly what Kodesh Baruch said, and that really was the kapara for the chet of the Eliel. This idea, there, there isn't time to do this. Maybe next week, Mr. Shem, next week will be the share. We'll maybe focus on some ideas about Purim. Because the following week, Ms. Hashem, today, two weeks, it will be Purim already. Uh, and there won't be a shir that night. Um, <clears throat> but that connects to Purim and Amalek. Why? Because the root of the Purim story is a lack of Emunas Chachomim. Not listening to Mordechai regarding the Suda. What's wrong? It's all kosher. It's a lack of Emunas Chachomim. And Klal Yisrael had to be mechaper for that exact problem. They had to fix the problem. They had to show Emunas Chachomim, and they repeatedly did so. They, Esther did it, she listened to Mordechai not to divulge her nationality. Klal Yisrael listened when Esther commanded Leich Knois Kol HaYehudim. They listened when Mordechai said to fast on Pesach, even though the day set aside for genocide was 11 months down the line. So you see that the whole story of Purim is about living life, not on our terms, but on the terms of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And therefore, that's also what uh, Zechir Samolek is. Zechir Samolek is to eradicate, Amolek is, uh, is gaiva. Is gaiva is, is a certain degree of arrogance. And uh, to eradicate our own gaiva, to be machni ourselves, to, 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 uh, to, to listen solely to what HaKadosh Baruch says, 
and also to demonstrate Emunas Chachomim. So that really is how it connects uh, to, to this Beit Salimbi. Perhaps more about that uh, next week. Okay, let's move on to one final uh, interesting idea. The Posuk says in Pashas Pekude, Ki Anan Hashem al Hamishkon Yoimum. It's in fact the last Posuk in Pashas Pekude, and indeed the last Posuk in the whole of Sefer Shemais. Ki Anan Hashem, the, the cloud of Hashem al Hamishkon Yoimum during the day, the HTL Lailaboy, Leene Kobes Israel, Bechol Mas Ayem. So the cloud of Hashem was on the Jewish camp, Bechol Mas Ayem, throughout their travels. Now Rashi's got a problem. Rashi's problem is, I don't get that. You see, the Pasuk says <coughs> in Lamed Vav that the cloud was not there when it was stationary. The Pasuk says, Uve heolos heon, this is in Pasuk Lamed Vav, two Pasuk Imaria. Uve heolos heon, mehamishkan, when the cloud would move up from when they were stationary, and then the cloud moved, then Yisru B'nei Yisra B'chol Maseihem. So the cloud was only on the Mishkan when it was stationary, when it was encamped. So what does the last possible mean? Ki Anan Hashem was on the camp whilst it was traveling. It wasn't. It was only on the camp. So Rashi deals with the problem. Says Rashi, The place where they were encamped was even that was called the Mokam Chaniyos. Let's do the Rashi inside. Before the eyes of Klal Yisrael in all of their journeys, at any stage of the journey which they would travel, the cloud would rest, uh, i.e., where the, the cloud would rest where they would travel. The cloud would rest in the place where they were going to camp. The place where they camp, that's also called a Maso. Proves it. The Chain Vayelech and Maso, he went to his journeys, i.e., the Mokum of the Machane. The Chain Ele Masse, etc. Le Fisha Ham Mokum Hachania, why is that? How can you explain that? Le Fisha Mim Mokum Hachania, because the, the encampments are referred to, to as journeys, because the, from the place of the encampment, Chosru Venosu, they traveled again. La Kach Nikru Kulon Maso, that's why they're all called journeys. Fine, so Rashi deals with the problem. So now what's Pshat in the Posuk? Ki anan Hashem ala mishkon b'chol maseihem. When the, the camp was stationary, when the mishkon was stationary, when Klal Yisrael had settled and they were encamped, then the clouds came and settled on the mishkon. And that's what it means, b'chol maseihem mokum chani oson. Fine, that is how Rashi deals with that problem. It says Rabbi Isaac Bernstein, an amazing, uh, an amazing insight. I saw this in an email from my friend. There's a beautiful uh, pshat of Rabbi Isaac Bernstein, that's all. What does that mean? The means it calls, the Mokam Chan Yosin is also called a Maso, i.e. that even when the camp is stationary, that's called, still called part of the journey. In other words, even when the camp is encamped and is stationary, we're still traveling. And that is a lesson for the whole of Golis. We can be stationary in Poland for 900 years, and we can be in Spain for 750 years, and we can be in Lithuania for a thousand years. But maybe we're encamped there, but we're still considered traveling. It was only on the camp when they were stationary, but that's still called Maseihem. There is an amazing Gemara in Baba Basra. Take a look at the last box on the page. The Gemara in Baba Basra in the Fayan Gimel has got a daf or two about all oh, the stories, like very uh, strange stories about shipwrecks and sailors and fish. And the Gemara tells them they're all Mishalim. There's a whole book, uh, Rabbi Aaron Feldman has written a book based on the Vilna Gaon's Pshat in that Gemara, I think the Jagger and the King, an amazing Gemara. So I'll give you one of the stories there and I'll show you an amazing insight of the Mashal. Says the Gemara Bar Basra, Omer Rabbi Bar Bachano, Zim Ninchado, one time, have a I was going on a ship. And we saw this large fish, we saw this enormous whale. That sand had sort of settled on the back of this fish. The Kodach Agma Iluya. And a meadow had sprouted on its back. We thought that this was dry land. 
So we got off, we disembarked, we got off the boat, for Salkinan, and we got out, for Afinon, and we settled there, and we baked, Vashdina, and we cooked, Agabe, on the back of the animal. Now, if you take out a barbecue, and you put it down on the back of a whale, thinking that it was dry land, the whale's going to get hot. The Katcham Gabe, and when it got too hot, the barbecue, the cooking, was burning the back of the whale, is hapich. The whale turned over. And if there wasn't a boat nearby, then we would have drowned. Ad Khan the Gemara. So the Marshal says an amazing thing. The Marshal says that this whole story is a marshal about Golas. That sometimes we get to a certain stage in the Golas, wherever it may be, and we think, we think this is dry land. We're here, we're encamped, we're going to be here forever. In fact, you know, they say that Poland, in Yiddish, is, it's Poilin. And they used to joke, Poilin, here we're going to stay. We're going to be there forever. But we know that 900 years of Golas, 900 years of, of staying in Poland, was snuffed out in a, in a few years. And like I said, we were in Lithuania for a thousand years, in Spain for 750 years. And, and even here in England and in America, there's no question, it's a Malchus Shulcheset. Baruch Hashem, we have the, the good fortune of being able to live Jewish lives uh, unhindered. <coughs> Baruch Hashem. But at the end of the day, we have to realize that this is not the end of the road. The journey only ends when Moshiach comes and when ultimately we go to Eretz Yisrael. And that's really what Rashi is saying over here. Ki anan Hashem al mishkan b'chol The cloud of Hashem was on the Mishkan whilst it was traveling. Says Rashi, what do you mean whilst it was traveling? The cloud was only settled on the, on the Mishkan when it was stationary, when it was encamped. Not when it was traveling. When it was traveling, the cloud got up and moved on. So therefore, says Rashi, no. Mokam chaniyos maso. Because in the Midbar, even the encampments were called traveling. You could be stationary, but that's still called traveling because you haven't reached your destination. And that's true of Golis. We've been in Golis now for... Ultimately, since we came out of Mitzrayim, first got to say, whatever it may be, for ultimately for 3,300 years, since we've been journeying in the times of the Mishkan, we haven't yet arrived at our des- destination. But the message of this final Rashi in this week's parasha is telling us that even when we're encamped, we are still traveling. And in Mitz Hashem, the journey will end in, soon with the coming of Mashiach when we get there to Israel and the Behirah of Yomeinah.